I'll bet you've had this experience where you sit down with a newly purchased sample library and you start going through the sounds and you find that you connect really strongly with some of these sounds and you start improvising and before you know it, you've written a whole new piece of music. Or you start to get excited at the potential of your new samples to let you write certain kinds of orchestral gestures or even write in styles of music that just never quite sounded right with your older sample libraries. I love when that happens, and I've written lots of new pieces based on the inspiration I've gotten from playing new samples and playing to their strengths. And there's a name for that, playing to the samples. In fact, the piece you're hearing in the background is the result of exactly all of that happening to me not that long after buying Cinematic Strings 2 and discovering its wonderful staccato articulations, which spoke more precisely and sounded more musical than any of the staccato articulations in my other libraries. Playing to the samples is often the result of us responding to the musicality and emotional tone of the performances by the musicians who were sampled, and that leads us to write certain kinds of lines and gestures, or even to write in certain styles. And sometimes we connect with the sampled instrument on such an organic level that it almost seems like the samples play themselves and help you write your music for you. I love when that happens too, and I'm sure you do as well. So now with this idea of playing to the samples in mind, Let's say that you've been hired to write a short musical sting, and the brief from the client was that it needs to sound very seriously classical and have a flashy or bold solo violin part. And of course, they don't have a budget for a real violin player. So you have to do it with samples, with solo violin being notoriously difficult to make sound realistic. But hey, you're a mock-up rock star, so you're down for the challenge. So here's the sketch, which is just piano strings, and timpani. Here it is again. And your concept is to have this flashy or bold violin part double what the piano is doing. Okay, and just recently you were playing around with the Vienna instrument solo violin and loving it to death. So you're going to try using those samples for this part. But here's the result. I'm going to solo the part so you can hear it clearly. Now the very last note sounds fantastic, but otherwise it kind of sounds like which is a technical term meaning that it sounds cloudy and mushy and aside from the last note, which is great, it sounds like the violinist has very poor technique. And the reason it sounds that way is because I played in the part very, very legato in an effort to achieve a smooth legato sound from the samples. So while the performance is good, the notes themselves just overlap too much, creating a very mushy and very fake sound. So I'm going to fix this by doing some MIDI editing using a technique I showed you a sneak preview of in previous tutorials, and that is to go into the Piano Roll Editor and make some adjustments to the note lengths. Specifically, I'm going to shorten the note lengths so that they don't overlap so much. Now, overlapping notes are fine when trying to create legato passages on piano, because where you have an overlap, you create a chord. And where you have a chord, you create a little bit of a sonic mush, which helps connect the planks of the piano notes. On the other hand, it's not characteristic of a solo violin to hear that sort of mush between the notes in a scalar passage. So after doing a bunch of tweaking, here's what I ended up with. It sounds better, but it still sounds like a synthy MIDI violin. Now it doesn't sound half bad, so one way to make this work would be to kind of bury it in the mix.
But my philosophy is that if a mocked up part has to be buried in the mix because it would be too embarrassing to have it sound any louder, it shouldn't be there at all. So now you're faced with a choice. Either present that to your client, and I know I wouldn't, or rewrite the part, reconceive the part, to play to the strength of the samples. And I thought to myself, you know, staccato samples, they sound pretty bold. Maybe I can make something out of those. But that last note is so impressive, maybe I can do some articulation switching from staccato to the sustained samples, and here's what I came up with. So as a result of being flexible, the part still fits the client's brief of flashy or bold, and it sounds pretty darn authentic. And in some ways, it sounds better than the original concept because it leaves room to hear the piano underneath it. Now, of course, no composer likes to have to make artistic compromises. But here we have a situation where the compromise is based on the strengths, or perhaps it would be better to say it's based on the weaknesses of the orchestra, in this case, our virtual orchestra. So here I'm talking about the idea of compromise in the pursuit of realism. And I think my dear friend Jay Asher, who's a composer here in L.A., put it best when he said that you have to write to the capabilities of the players. For instance, you could write a high C on French horn for an L.A. session player without having to worry if they could hit the note or not. But you just wouldn't write that kind of thing for a kid playing French horn for the first time in a middle school orchestra. So when it comes to the idea of creating realistic mock-ups, I think it's important to be flexible to a certain degree. And, of course, if you really must have that flurry of violin notes, as in the original concept you had, then your choices are either to go out of pocket and hire a real violin player, or, if you have another violin sample library, give that one a shot and see if you get better results with it. 